Cornelius Fisher said today in her lunchbox, um, it becomes imperative for us to turn towards nature and see where we fit within nature, not how we dominate or how we control nature, but how we engage in this symbiotic relationship between our human existence and our natural existence. And I think in a lot of ways, Jane has been ahead of the game for quite some time on that. And so um, I'm really looking forward to this session. It's gonna be a family affair. And uh, are we ready to bring Jane on, Shoshana? Yes, we are. She looks okay. ready too. Well, thank you so much for joining us at the Zero to Fierce Festival. After Jane, we're gonna have a little conversation right here in the lobby, our television studio lobby. So um, enjoy your time with Jane Bothwell and we will see you afterwards at Zero to Fierce. Thank you. Okay, Jane, you are here. <laughs> Thank you, Shoshana. Thank you, Jackie, so much for the beautiful introduction. And um, I am very happy to be here sharing herbs on Zero to Fierce. So, yeah. So I'd like to start with um, a little prayer, maybe a song. So welcome, everybody, and take a breath. Feel your feet on the earth. Allow your shoulders to drop and your breath to become deeper. Allow yourself, if you would like, to become more present in this moment. As we gather together today to learn more and share more of the ancient craft of plant medicine, know what to say. Why did I say I wanted to say Thanks. It's an honor. All my relations, my teachers, the plant teachers, the divine beings that guide us, and especially thankful to the plants that speak to us, bring us here all together to learn more of their healing ways and how to have fun out in nature. Oh, Bless it be, give thanks. All right. So plants are everywhere and they are everywhere for us. They are really here for us. So look around whatever space you're in right now and how many things in that space came from plants. Probably almost everything. And we all know how healing it can be to be out in nature. We even have a term for it now because there's deprivation of it called green bathing. So just to be out and walking with the plants is amazingly healing and brings great renewal. And so I'm going to talk about a number of different things to do with your plants. And we've got some live plants here and some dry plants. And I have my wonderful assistant, Raquel Nelson, on the sidelines Hello. here, <laughs> who is my um, right-hand woman up here. She does all the administrative stuff. And so she's going to be pushing the buttons here and um, keeping me on track. <laughs> All right, so let's start that show that we have. We'll share the screen. And the first thing that I'm going to um, demonstrate and talk with you about is um, the host disabled sharing. What is it? the host disabled sharing? We're not the host. Yeah, we're not the host. Oh, we're not the host. So hi, Jane. I'm yeah. here. Um, who who was it Jean's screen that you wanted to share? Yes. Got it. Could Jean, could you turn your camera on? Oh no, we want to yes. share. Okay. I'll oh, there we go. Thank you. Is that Haley? We wanted to share a, a PowerPoint. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I understand now. <laughs> we want to 
be enabled. Yes, We're do. Do. <laughs> but these herbs can help us go from disabled yes. to able. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I guess Jean can sh sh turn her camera off now. <laughs> Jackie's, you can mute. <laughs> oh, how funny. Okay, I think that's... Um... Jane, would you try now, please? Okay. We will. Yay. There we go. We're getting it. Okay. There. Yay, technology. Yay, technical <laughs> assistance. Oh, I'm so glad it worked. Yay. Oh, yeah, Jane, I'm I'm right here if you need anything. Sorry that took a second. Yeah, I don't think we're there yet. Getting there. Getting there? Getting there. Okay. Oh, look. Do you all see a PowerPoint show now? Do you see that, Haley? Yep, yeah. I see that. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Let's move this little screen. Okay. You can move that far up. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Next. Herbs and self care, zero to fears. Yeah. Here we go. So, and I was mentioning earlier, our plants are here to support us. And so we have this beautiful collage with the redwood trees and we all know how empowering they can be for us. And the wild rose is a beautiful plant for opening the heart. And the violets, another wonderful heart herb and both of these edible flowers you can be tossing in your salads. And then we have the yarrow, which is a herb of bringing strength and courage and fortitude. And then we have this picture of our calendula blossoms. And the more flowers that you have in your life, the more fairies that you're gonna see in your life. <laughs> and so calendulas, we like to eat them and make tea from them and, and make oil from them. And we're gonna be doing that a little later. Okay. So dry herb blending. So we have a formula here of a zero to fierce um, tea recipe. And so in our special tea recipe today, we are going to put stinging nettles. And, and so I have obviously big jars of herbs and because I go through a lot of them and have a teaching center here. But you have our two wonderful herb shops here, Moonrise Herbs and Humboldt Herbals. And you can go in and get little bags to big bags, whatever kind of quantity you want. So when you come home with all those little bags and you think, well, what am I gonna do with them? <laughs> and so this would be us coming home with our herbs. We get out a magical bowl, we light a candle, we've said our prayers, maybe we burn a little bit of healing plant medicine right here, some sage, and we say prayers that this tea be all that we want it to be. And in this case, this is a tea for celebrating zero to fierce. And then you just take your plants and you mix them up. So we have stinging nettle. So we're gonna take a little bit of that. And you can see that this nettle, I think you can see, you could hold that up, is in pretty large pieces because this is nettle that we harvested ourselves. Okay, and then the next thing we have here is oats. And with the oats, I like to use the stem and the tops. And when I harvest them myself, I have them in the same jar. But here, these are ones that we purchased. So here's some beautiful oat tops. We're gonna have about the same amount that we put in of our nettles. And we're saying may this tea be healing and fortifying. I would say this would be a really good fortifying tea. And now we have the magic Tulsi basil. And I have slides of all these too that I'll show you after we put this together. So with the Tulsi basil or holy basil, 
And I really want to put a shout out to the Oshala Farms, where we got this um, wonderful herb from. They're in Southern Oregon. They're definitely one of our neighbors. And they have one of the best qualities of um, plants that you can buy, truthfully. They hand mix those and it's just wonderful. Okay, and now we have some roses. So we have these beautiful rose buds here that's just gonna add color and scent and magic, more magic into our tea. And so when you buy herbs in the store, they're generally um, cut in really small pieces because that's how they're commercially prepared, which is perfectly fine. But that, but these, since they're more the homegrown type, you've got larger pieces. It's going to last for longer. So we have this beautiful bowl here for our tea blends so we're just going to mix it all up so there's our bulk herbs and then it's very easy to make our bulk herbs into tea we're going to take a one quart uh, canning jar and you put these are in bigger pieces but when they're cut and sifted you're going to put about a tablespoon per cup and an extra tablespoon per pot or jar. So a quart has four cups. So we're going to put about four tablespoons and then an extra tablespoon for our jar. And we're just going to put these in here. And with leafy and flowery plant parts, you just need to steep it which means you put the boiling water over it and let it steep. If we had roots and barks and seeds, then what we would need to do is to simmer them for about 45 minutes. Because it takes more heat and energy to extract and break down harder plant parts. So here's our beautiful Zero to Fierce tea blend. We're gonna pour our boiling water over it. And voila. Always cover your teas because you're gonna lose a lot through the air if you don't. So one, I think I'll stir that a little bit. So one of the questions always is how long do you let your tea steep? Okay. So you see, I put quite a herb in here. You could, you know, put less if you want, but I'm mostly interested in a good medicinal cup of tea. And again, a tablespoon per cup, tablespoon of herb. And so with this tea, we could let it steep 10 minutes, 20 minutes. We could let it steep a couple hours. And some people leave their herbs in their jar and then they'll get one of those beautiful bamboo straws or metal straws that um, you can get locally. And you just sip it through there and they just leave the herbs in. Um, so let's say with this tea that you want to drink a cup a day. So now we've made about four cups. And so we let this steep, I probably let it steep, ideally 20 minutes to a couple hours and then strain it out and you can keep your tea in the refrigerator if you want to and then just bring it out warm it up or drink it cold you can add milk you can add sugar you can add honey all different things to your tea lemons or limes and so this would be a great medicinal tea for bringing stamina and vitality and resilience which we can all use anytime. So we're going to let this tea blow a while, and then recall and we're going to drink tea with you. All right, so that's using dry plant material. 
And we can also make tea with fresh plant material. And this is so fun because you basically just go out into your garden and this climate any time of year and pick your plants and chop them up or just break them up and put them in a jar and pour the water over them and you have a lovely tea. So I picked here for you today, um, borage flowers and a little bit of stem. So you can hold them. And I'm just gonna break this up a little bit, giving thanks for cheerful courage and strength of heart and lots of nutrients and calcium and magnesium and all sorts of wonderful things in this borage. And borage, the whole plant is edible. A lot of you may have borage in your garden. It self seeds and you have it forever. Delicious leaves, really delicious flowers. Take one of those flowers and put one, um, make a um, juice tea and put it in an ice cube tray and stick your borage flower in each one of those cubicles and you'll have this lovely ice cube with borage. All right, so there's our borage. And now we have our delicate, lovely little violets. And we're just gonna put those in our jar as well. With um, fresh herb teas, again, the quantities, it depends how much you want in there, but I most of the time will loosely fill my jar with the fresh herbs and then pour the boiling water over. And this is lemon balm. And a lot of you may have lemon balm in your garden. Lemon balm makes a wonderful, wonderful, delicious tea. Anything citrusy lifts the spirits. Ah, smells so good. Wish we could smell. I mean, we will probably be able to in a few months over Zoom, but <laughs> not yet. <laughs> but that will make our classes a lot easier when we can. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So we're just breaking this up and putting this in the jar. I think I'll give a little bit to Raquel and she can break some up into her lap or on your cutting board there and then bring it over here and stick it in the jar. So I really, um, a lot of times I make walk around the yard tea. <laughs> And so that is literally walk around the yard and see what's out there that you can put in a jar and pour hot water over it, make a delicious tea. So if we wanted to make a sun tea, then we would just put um, room temperature tap water over the herbs and stick it out in the sun. And today we could make a magical spring rain tea <laughs> and so we could put this out. And then if you want to make moon tea, then you do the same thing. You just have your jar with your fresh or dry herbs, either one, put it out under the moon and then bring it in in the morning and, um, and strain off your herbs and drink your lovely tea. Perfect. You can also make tea out of a lot of your culinaries, your basil, your oregano, your thyme, and all of those herbs, those culinaries, which I like to call the spaghetti herbs, are very strengthening for our immune system. And a lot of people think about echinacea and astragalus and herbs like that and elderberry, but all those spaghetti herbs that you very well may be growing are wonderful immune herbs. Okay, so pour over our lemon balm borage violet fresh herb tea. Mm. Oh, and then you can hit a little steam. Ah, oh, some aromatherapy, some facial steam. Mm, lovely, lovely, lovely. Okay, so now we're going to let this one sit 
So you could see how it was loosely filled, we'll stir this a little too, with the herbs, but then when the water gets in there, just they compact a bit. Okay. So we're thinking about the qualities of the herbs that we choose, the aroma, the energetics of them, all sorts of things. So here's our two teas that we'll let brew for a while. And you may already be able to notice, I can from here, that the dry plants infuse a darker color more quickly and all in all, they're gonna be darker. Fresh plants, sometimes they hardly change the color of the water. And sometimes people think my tea didn't work, <laughs> but it did work. It's just that the fresh plants, the cells haven't broken down and dried and that's when more color is imparted, is from dry plant material. But medicinally and either one is excellent and really, if you have the fresh herbs, I think it's so magical to make teas with fresh herbs. And the other thing about that is that it gets you outside, which is, I think, such a healing thing for all of us. Okay. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> these individual herbs. So we have violet here. Um, locally, we have the yellow violet, which is Viola sempervirens. And here we have the purple one on our screen. Most people are more familiar with the purple violet. The whole plant is edible. The leaves, the stems, the flowers, the roots, I haven't, I don't generally eat the roots, but you could. And um, so they're really delicious in salads. They're very specific for the heart. The Dr. No Signatures denotes that the shape of a leaf can tell you about what part of the body it might be helpful for. So we have the violet here and it's really good in salads and delicious in our tea. And here's our lemon balm. And with the lemon balm is, um, uh, as I mentioned before, anything citrusy lifts the spirits. And lemon balm is also a good digestive aid. It also helps clear the sinuses. And it's an amazing antiviral, which, you know, this beautiful, common, self-seeds everywhere, delicious tasting plant has the strong properties as an antiviral. So a really good one for us to know about during our viral times. Stinging nettles, urtica, dioica, is an amazing medicinal plant. And I think there's probably some of you out there going, what? That plant that when I was a kid, I came home with welts all over and tried to avoid? Well, now... As an older kid, you are out there harvesting it and steaming it and making nettle lasagna and nettle spanakopita, and you're putting nettle in your tea and fresh nettle preparation as tea or as a tincture is one of the best things that I know for alleviating seasonal allergies. And so, and nettle is nourishing to the blood. It's strengthening, it's food for our entire system. And it's nettle season right now. The nettles are popping up and it's time to go out and harvest those. And whenever we're harvesting, we really want to pay good attention. We wanna be very present. We want to really be communicating with the plants. We want to introduce ourselves. So you go up and you go, hello, I'm Jane. And I'm here because I honor and I respect you. And, and I would like to use your medicine. And so, and sometimes you're gonna hear from that plant, well, no. <laughs> and so pay attention because it's very important for us to have a communication going that this is a relationship. It's not just us taking and plants giving. The plants are very, very happy to give. It's us taking and giving back our gratitude, giving back our cultivation. 
system, encouraging those stands plants, learning how they grow. Um, do we need to seeds of them? Do I need to leave root cuttings or crown cuttings? And it really should look like you were not there when you harvest. And leaving an offering, and an offering could be some of your hair, it can be a special rock you have in your pocket, it can be a song, but it's important, a very important part of our herbal medicine. Uh, and here we have the oats. And so you see up there in the corner, you'll see the picture of the oat tops of the person holding them. And then you'll read a lot in your herbal um, books and also um, in, at the store, they'll talk about oats in the milky stage. And so what you wanna do is you want to look for when you squeeze that oat top, a white milky juice comes out. And this again, all grows all over around here. This is Avena sativa, sativa means cultivated. Uh, you can use any of the Avenas. And one of the main ones we have here is Avena fatua. It's a smaller than the sativa. Like most things, the wild ones, like wild strawberries, a lot smaller than cultivated strawberries. One of the things we do in cultivation is go for bigger, better. Not always better, though, bigger. So. You squeeze it and truthfully, it's like popping a pimple. It says white milky juice that comes out and that's the unripe seed and you've got this beautiful green grass and these squishy tops and then I harvest the whole thing. I go down the stem and break that off so I have the milky tops and the straw as it's called and dry that and save that for tea all throughout the winter. Very high in calcium and magnesium, great nervous system herb, and it helps you to be flexible and fluid, just like the grasses that blow in the wind. It's really an amazing plant. They're all amazing, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we love them all. <laughs> okay, so here we have the Tulsi or holy basil. You can also use just regular basil. You can use the purple basil, the green basils, whatever basils you may have growing in your garden. And again, I mentioned the spaghetti herbs, um, basil being one, that are uh, greatly enhancing for the immune system. The Tulsi is very strengthening for the nervous system, brings you a lot of resiliency, and it's a delicious flavor. So roses. <laughs> so you have here a picture of a fancy cultivated rose, which is multi-petaled. And then you have the wild rose, which is single five-petaled flower. And again, another example of wild versus cultivated. And so the, um, the key, I think, in using roses is that you pick roses that are very fragrant. And some of your new hybrids have no scent at all. You can still use them and they're beautiful, but go for a more fragrant. And rose, of course, is a plant of the heart. It's a plant that helps you to go through the thorns as well as the beauty. I'm gonna get some water. Okay. Just have a little water break here. Good clean water. So spearmint, our main mints are spearmint and peppermint. Peppermint is a lot more purple. It's a lot stronger minty flavor. Spearmint is greener and a mellower flavor and uh, very easy to grow. And you, you can use all these different mints pretty interchangeably. They're activators for your formula. They help move the other herbs. They add flavor and enhance beauty into your tea. Okay, so here's some tea basics. Steep teas for 20 minutes or more. Okay, use two tea, two tea bags for more effect. 
So a lot of times if I'm using commercial tea bags, I'll put in two. But when you think it's it's fun to open up a tea bag and look inside too, mm -hmm. because I mentioned earlier that we have a larger pieces of these herbs from companies that do it by hand. We have the main cut and sifted, which are much smaller, which are the main things sold in the herb shops. And then we have one called tea cut. And the tea cut is a lot smaller pieces. And so I always wondered how can this one small tea bag make a good, good strong cup of tea? It's because they're cut into much smaller pieces, not powdered, but tea cut. And so take a look at them, open them up. And always cover your herbs while they're steeping, even if you have herbs in a, just a cup like this, mm -hmm. you know, put something over the top while it's steeping because you lose a lot of the volatile oils into the air. Um, this is a really, I want to look at that in a minute. Okay. <laughs> um, decoct means to simmer. So when you're using roots and barks, so let's say we want to make a dandelion root stinging nettle tea. So we would chop up our dandelion roots, or maybe they're already chopped, and we'll simmer those for about a half hour and then turn it off and add the nettles and then infuse it. So that's combining decoction and infusion. Do we have a chat going with possible questions? I can see some questions on there, but maybe when we take a break in the middle, okay. we can start okay, answering Okay, that's a good them. idea. Okay. Yeah. Um, so again, I think I mentioned before, make in large batches. You can refrigerate for three to four days. You can reheat it, drink it cold. And I don't know about you, but a lot of times I'll just open the fridge and go, what is there to drink in here? Mm -hmm. And if my herb tea's there, I think, great, okay. Yeah. Whereas I might not have thought of it if I hadn't already made a big batch of it. And I usually have a few of them going in the refrigerator. And you might want to label them. I was drinking yes. one this afternoon. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure what it was. It tasted good, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, you know, I generally know what's in there, but you might want to label your teas that are in the fridge. Yeah. I would say for all your herbal concoctions, you think you'll remember what it is, but yes. you never do. <laughs> Very good point, Raquel. Label everything and put a date on it yes. and put everything that's in it. And if you don't have labels, masking tape works well mm -hmm. and painter's tape. Mm -hmm. That blue painter's tape works really well and it comes off your jars easily. And... Um, you might also, if you're really going to start concocting here, you might want to get an herbal notebook yes. for your recipes. And then you just write down, I made this, it tasted awful. <laughs> I dumped it. I made this. It tasted great. We drank, you know, quarts and quarts of it. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, this worked better fresh, that worked better dry. So it's really fun to start an herbal notebook. All right, so we want to um, strain now. What's what's next? Oh, that I think is it for the tea blends. Then we oh, now we're on wild foods. Food. Yeah, yeah. Let's go go back one. Okay. And, okay. So going to strain some of our tea. This is a really nice strainer. It just sits in your cup. It has these really pretty moons and suns. And I noticed the box doesn't have pictures of the moons and the suns. No, they're all the plain. Yeah, yeah. but inside there were moons and suns. Yeah. It was a great <laughs> happy surprise. Yeah, it was a happy <laughs> surprise. Okay. okay. While you're doing that, I'll check out the chat. Oh yeah, check out the okay. chat. Okay. Thanks for your patience with us, you guys. Yes, thank you. Okay. Everyone oh. missed you, Jane, with the slideshow. Everyone was saying, oh, Jane's so tiny. We want to see her. So they're happy that you're big again and they can see you. 
They can also um, split their screen. Yeah, uh, Jackie was mentioning that. And at the very end, I did let people know that they had the option. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm looking at the plant pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Larger screen, larger screen. All right. Okay, so here's our tea. Cheers. Here's to vitality, stamina, exuberance, zero to fears. Zero to fears. I don't know. Is there a good way to get the color of the tea in here? Going down. Yeah. I'm guzzling my tea. And I'm spilling mine. Good time. I saw that. That was a beautiful color. Oh, you can see the color? Good. Good. <laughs> mm. Okay. Should we let our fresh ones steep a little longer? Mm. Yeah, we'll let yeah. that one steep a little bit longer. Okay. Do we have any questions in there? I don't see. I think it's all about you being larger. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Seems we'll just keep to be going on then. Okay. Yeah. All righty. So back here. Here we go. So and... now we're going to talk about wild food and. There's a whole lot on your screen right now about it, right? <laughs> um, delicious and nutritious addition to your diet. Young greens are going to be tastier than the older ones. And um, you can add wild edibles to any of your dishes. And you probably don't want to do just wild edibles, um, especially for somebody who's not used to it, because then that would be a very good cleansing agent. <laughs> I remember one of my students came one year and she said, I've got this new boyfriend and I can't, and I don't know what's up with him, but I'm cooking him all this really great food and he's just got diarrhea all the time. And I said, well, what was he eating before he got together with you? And she said, just, you know, mainstream diet. I said, now you're giving him all wild greens. <laughs> No wonder. <laughs> so introduce them slowly. They're potent and strong mm. and delicious. And let's look at some of the ones that we have here on. Okay, so we have stinging nettles first. And I mentioned about, um, I'll give you a little more details. So um, you want to harvest stinging nettle before it flowers. And this one is flowering in this picture. Mm -hmm. So that's a good example of the flower, those tiny little racemes that hang down. And um, so you're harvesting it and you're using the tender young stems and the leaves and you generally are steaming it like you would steam any green. And one thing I like to do this time of year because it's nettle time is steam them and freeze some just like your frozen spinach in your freezer, freeze little packets of frozen nettle. Mm -hmm. And then when you go to make your omelet and it's not nettle season, you go up oh, in the freezer, you've got your frozen nettle. You can make nettle pesto called Nesto if you want. And as soon as you put the oil over the nettles, the sting is gone. Just the same as soon as you put the water over the nettle, the sting is gone because the sting on the nettle is a hair and the hair has an acid on it and your skin reacts to the acid on the hair. But as soon as that is broken down, then there's no sting. So, and then if you grab your nettles, if you grab them firmly, there's going to be less sting or maybe none than if you just brush against it because you're smushing those hairs. Mm -hmm. So stinging nettles are just fabulous wild food. Oh my gosh, the other day I was at, um, out at Phoenix Cafe, which I wanna give a shout out to, most fabulous food I had there in Arcata. And one of my um, past students was out there and she goes, oh, just, are you gonna be here a little while? And I said, yeah, she goes, I live really close by, I wanna bring you something. She brought me stinging nettle cake. 
it was out of this world <laughs> and it was had all this like lichen-y decoration on it and google it you'll find it it's a happening thing now stingy nettle cake with matcha buttercream icing so i mean what could be better chickweed is everywhere right now it's in a lot of a lot of your gardens and so you can pick your chickweed and little star lady is another name for it this is a plant that tastes very good um, raw, whereas a lot of them taste much better cooked. Like the nettles, you wouldn't want to eat that one raw because you could get stuck in your mouth. <laughs> but like dandelion greens, when you eat them raw, which I do and a lot of us do, they are much stronger than when you cook them. But the chickweed tastes like a luscious, fresh, green um, salad green. So. Again, all these wild edibles, here you go next one, are higher in nutritional value than any of your cultivated food, any of it. They're much more concentrated with nutrients. And so I encourage you all to go wild food shopping, just like you go to the co-op or wild berries or Safeway, go wild food shopping, go out with your basket, pick your greens, and and put them in your bag and put them in the produce part of your refrigerator so that when you go to make your food, um, you, you like most of us, we're like, what's in here to eat? Like our tea, what is in here to drink? And you pull out and you go, oh, look at all these great wild greens. I could make an omelet. I could make a beautiful salad. So of course your food is fresher if you pick it right away. But think about it. Um, how long was that broccoli pick that you bought at the grocery store, right? And we're not all gonna go out every time before we're gonna eat to pick our food fresh. Um, it's a good thing to do though, to, to, to do more often, you know, put a good thing. So I'll stay on that one. So having that bag of wild food in your fridge, you'll probably eat more and um, it's a good thing to do to put a little bit of wild food in every meal because we can all benefit from being a little bit wilder like <laughs> nature. Yes. Bitter crass. Have I been looking at this one for a while? You might have <laughs> for a minute. But I don't think I said it. Too. No, not yet. Mm. <laughs> this tea is so good. Um so bitter crust is a tiny little plant that's in most people's gardens right now. It's more so you're going to see it in your, in your cultivated garden beds as a weed. And it tastes like, um, it tastes like watercress. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really yummy. So this is so fun, I think, because I'm sure that a number of you are going, I pulled that out of my garden yeah. yesterday. I pulled that out of my garden. <laughs> so now the weeds, instead of going into the compost, are going into your salad bowl. Okay, radishes and mustard. So driving along 101 between Arcata and Eureka and all that yellow flower that's on the median, that's wild mustard. And it's delicious flower, delicious leaf, really robust leaves, so you can easily make steamed greens out of it. And but you don't want to harvest what's growing along the freeway. So another point here to consider is where are you harvesting from? So you want to harvest from areas that are as clean as they possibly can be. And so we don't always know what was sprayed or put in the soil or so, um, but think about that when you're harvesting. The wild radish tends to have a yellow, uh, I mean a purple or a white flower to it. And so the radishes and the mustards before they flower look very, very similar. Um, and when they're flowering, they look a little different with the flower color being different. And, but taste them. I mean, when I'm taking people on herb walks, I'm just like, well, let's eat it. Does it taste like a radish leaf or does it taste like a mustard leaf? And this last herb walk that I took a um, group of my students on, we went down to the Freshwater Nature Preserve. It's a beautiful little walk down there. 
And um, she, I don't remember the Italian name, but she said that when she grew up and she was traveling with her family and her mom and her grandma would say, pull over, there's wild mustard and wild radish. And then the name for it is um, um, pasta wild along the road. <laughs> Something like that. But, and they would take these mustard greens and radish greens home and chop them up and cook them in with garlic and have that be the sauce for their pasta. Mm. Oh, so it's one of the dishes. I know, doesn't that sound great, yeah. Rico? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So after that herb walk, we all decided we we're going to go home and make that. And there are a lot of um, the, the greens are really robust. So a lot of it along the coast, uh, the, you know, you're going to see it everywhere. So it's a really great edible to know. The seed pods, when they're young and fleshy, are really tasty, like in stir, stir fries, they give it a crunch. Um, the seeds themselves, once they're mature of the mustard, are what mu prepared mustard is made out of, is ground mustard seed. All right, here's some wild food recipes to enjoy. One of my favorite things is to make wild herb pesto. Uh, another class recently, we picked, I think, I don't know, I could have been close to 20 different plants. <laughs> but we just walked around outside and thankfully it was a nice day so we could have class up here and be socially distanced and masked up. And um, so, and we took our Cuisinart outside on the picnic table with a long extension cord. We did everything out there to be COVID conscious and safe. And so we picked um, bitter crust and we picked some nettles and we picked some violets and we picked some redwood sorrel. A lot mm -hmm. of people call it clover, redwood cl clover, but it's a uh, sorrel and it uh, looks kind of like a clover. It's a ground cover in the redwoods, green on the top, purple underneath, pink flower, delicious sour flavor. That's really good in pesto. We picked sheep sorrel. We picked so many different things. We, we toasted sunflower seeds and chopped up a bunch of garlic and put that in the bottom of the cuisinart, blended it up, threw in all these many, many herbs. And I always do go through the bowl to make sure <laughs> that we've got all edibles. There are very, very few poisonous plants, but it all takes as one, right? So, yeah. yep. but in decades and decades of teaching herbal medicine, and um, I've only had two times where people really, three times where people really did um, create some discomfort from the food they ate. But two of those times were eating daffodil bulbs that they were on. I know, it doesn't smell like onion yeah. at all, but that be sick, and nobody's died. <laughs> and another one was someone eating a lot of wild ginger, and again, digestive upset. And a note on wild ginger, I would at this point leave it alone. Appreciate that incredible, beautiful flower, the great way that the ginger grows in the forest floor, mm -hmm. and it's just magical, and that flower is probably start blooming soon, so yeah. really look for it. But let's leave that one. On that note, there's a great organization called United Plant Savers. Yes. And United Plant Savers is exactly that. A group of all of us who want to save the plants. And so look into that if you want to, United Plant Savers. So here's just some possible recipes for pesto. Now, after you make your pesto, you can put it in ice cube trays and freeze it. And so then pop that out after they're frozen. And then you'll have a bag of wild spring green pesto in the middle of summer. Um, I rarely use basil anymore because mm -hmm. I just love the wild greens so much. Dandelion I put in there. And the pesto that's in your jar, in your refrigerator, put a layer of olive oil over the top. Because if you pour a layer of olive oil on the top of your pesto, it won't brown. So that's a way to keep your pesto from browning. It still tastes good brown, but 
we like it better with bright green. Yeah. So. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Steamed greens with feta. Mm -hmm. So any of your greens, steam them up, chop garlic, add feta, and mm, what a delicious dish. And you might want to add cultivated greens in with your wild greens, just for the flavor for people. So on my webpage, there are numerous wild food recipes, and you might want to go check that out. And there also is on the web page a virtual um, herb walk. And there's a lot of pictures from plants that grow around here. It can help you ID them mm -hmm. and also can be fun to go on a virtual herb walk. Yeah. Dandelion. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to um, full screen. Full screen. Yeah. Okay, and here I am full screen, <laughs> alive and well. <laughs> so I harvested some dandelions earlier, and there's no flowers um, because it was too cold and wet, and so they were all closed up. But here's a dandelion. Hello, everybody. There's a little flower bud in the center there about to come up. <laughs> There's puppy crying at the door. <laughs> She's probably fine. <laughs> okay. And so dandelion, yeah. what are you going to do? So you're going to go out and you're looking for, hmm, well, what do I say? Okay. There's a false dandelion and a true dandelion. The good news is they're interchangeable medicinally and edible wise. So it doesn't really matter which one you have. Um, some ways to ID the difference, the true dandelion flowers now in the late winter and the spring. And the true dandelion, how's that on the wall there? I can tilt it if you Is want it to see it. or something? Oh, I think it's just hung. Yeah, I think you could take I it. I guess you could tilt it. You want to take it over there? We have this great dandelion poster that we are going to take the computer to. Okay, so you can see here that dandelion has one flower per stem. So there's many flowers on this dandelion, but there's not more than one flower per stem. If the plant is flowering, that's one of the main ways to tell the difference between dandelion and false dandelion. False dandelion has a branching flowering stem with more than one flower on the stem, okay? So you can see that these are the different stages of the plant. Here's the bud. Here's when it's opening, going to seed. And it's just beautiful, isn't it? You make all your wishes with your dandelion. Okay, we can go back. Thank you so much, Raquel. Mm -hmm. I cannot <laughs> do this by myself. <laughs> all right. So you, um, your true dandelion also has smooth leaves, not hairy. And your false dandelion has hairy leaves, but there is a variety of false dandelion that has smooth leaves. Most of it's hairy, but hairy cat's ears is another name for it. True dandelion is Taraxicum officinale, and the false is Hypocharis. So I so we talked already about putting dandelion in your salad, steaming dandelion, um, and you could and you could make tea from this dandelion. So let's look at it. So you go out, you ID your dandelion. You can just pick some of the leaves of the dandelion and bring it in and eat it, which is what I did at lunch. I 
I always like to add something from outside to my food. So I picked dandelion and some chickweed and some borage flowers and chopped them up, some arugula. And it's amazing the flavor that this is going to impart into your food. And the dandelion leaf is a little bit bitter, but when you chop it in small pieces and mix it in with the rest of your meal, you it's going to enhance those flavors. And thankfully now, bitter is very popular. Yeah, and bitter enhances digestion. It enhances um, your liver function and your gallbladder. There's a lot of really good benefits that you get from putting a little bit of bitter flavor into your meals. And um, so we have our dandelion. We could just pick the leaves. You can pick the flower and just sprinkle that. I, I like taking the petals off and sprinkling that in my food. Really beautiful. And um, you can also put, this is really fun. You can make cornbread, like make a batter of cornbread and pour the batter into your pan and then place flowers on top, like place dandelion flowers and, and borage flowers and calendula flowers. And a lot of flowers retain their color even after they bake. So like bachelor's buttons. And so it could be really fun to, it is really fun cooking with flowers. So we pick some, we put it in our salad. We could pick some up and just chop up the leaves and put them in the jar and make our fresh plant tea. The dandelion leaf is very specific for the urinary system and it helps, to, helps you to excrete excess water. So it's a diuretic. So if you get bloated with excess water around your moon time, then drink some dandelion leaf tea. Um, if your like, ankles are puffy, your wrists are kind of puffy, you feel like you're retaining water, drink dandelion leaf tea. Um, with the most all herbal diuretics are self-limiting meaning that you will excrete the excess water only to the point that it's excess. Whereas a lot of your pharmaceutical diuretics, they're just going to keep on having that diuresis action in the body. So that's one great um, use for the leaves. And oh, and the flowers make a really great massage oil. We're going to talk about, we're going to make calendula oil later. So we'll talk about that then. And so here I dug up the whole plants. So we have the root and the leaf and a flower bud. And so what I would do with this, which I did after I got my first COVID vaccine and ode to vaccines, is that I went out in the yard and I dug up dandelions and I chopped up the root and I simmered the root and then I turned it off and chopped up the leaves and added the leaves and then I added some nettle and some chickweed and it tasted really good and felt really good in my body. And the root is very specific for the liver. So with the dandelion root, it helps to tonify the liver. It helps the liver to process strange substances. <laughs> and it helps the liver to regenerate, to function more efficiently. It's a good spring cleanser. It's really, really great. So um, mm, a step here, you wash them off after you dig them up and you very rarely will get the whole root. So you can see how the root is broken off here. Maybe if I'd been a little more patient and it wasn't raining, I might have dug a little deeper. But um, with, so you harvest it, you're giving thanks, you're covering it up, making it look like you weren't there. Um, and then you come in and wash it, but you will notice that the, Dandelion root inside is white and on the outside it's brown, light brown. Now you don't want to brush off all that brown. That's not dirt, it's the color of the root. Okay, so you don't want to scrub that all off. 
You just want to scrub off what the dirt is there. So then we ID'd it, harvested, gave thanks, gave thanks and harvested, <laughs> come in and just chop it up. So I'll chop up the root, make a pile of root over here. Want me to zoom in a little bit? What? You want me to zoom in on you a little bit? Um, sure. Okay. So you can see what she's doing here. And here's a little one. <laughs> We're laughing because the puppy is continuing to whine at the door. We may have to let her in. Okay, so here we have our root. It's just all chopped up. And then, well, let's just get a pan out and Okay, so we'll take this pan, we'll put our root in there, put a little I think I know where one is hiding. I'll do it here. Okay, that works. Got okay. It. Good got to it. be resourceful. Yes. <laughs> We've got a lid on that and we'll simmer that for, I'll simmer it about 20 minutes. And then we will add the fresh leaves. And we'll steep that about another 20 minutes. And voila, you have fresh harvested dandelion root tea. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Cook the dandelion roots. So if you wanted to saute it or and put it in a stir fry, you could do it the same way. And some of you maybe have had roasted dandelion root, mm -hmm. which it makes a really delicious tea. And um, it's heartier. It's like the difference between raw coffee beans and roasted coffee beans. It adds that strong roasted flavor. If you want to roast your own dandelion, you start with dry dandelion. So on that note, if you wanted to dry this dandelion, I think we have one here, but um, you just um, chop it up like that, just like I did. Take a little basket and then put a piece of cloth on the basket put your roots on that, hang it somehow closer to the ceiling by your wood stove, because most of the heat is up here by your wood stove, and then dry your root, okay? Um, in drying your plants, you want air circulation, you want heat, about 80 degrees, <laughs> and you want it to be out of direct sunlight. Okay, all of that's really important in drying your herbs. But, um, okay, so you have your dry dandelion that you dried yourself or you bought at the herb shop or the grocery store. And then you take a cast iron pan and it's like toasted sesame seeds, toasting sesame seeds. Dry cast iron pan, get it hot, Put the dandelion in, roast it until it starts smelling roasted on medium heat, and you're done. And then let it cool and put it in a jar. And that's going to be a much heartier flavor of dandelion when you roast it. It's almost chocolatey, I find. It is yeah. almost chocolatey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in that regard, one of my favorite teas is um, roasted dandelion and peppermint because it tastes like chocolate mint yeah. to me, which is one yeah. of my favorite chocolate flavors. <laughs> yeah, I haven't put those two together yet. So mm -hmm. just... okay. Yeah, roasted dandelion and peppermint. <laughs> Hey, Jane, um, we had a question here uh, for you um, from an audience member. Okay. What are some main things to avoid when foraging? 
like advice for beginners to collecting wild plants? Come on an herb walk first. <laughs> <laughs> or go out, I mean, so many people know wild plants now, so go out with friends first, or come on or walk with somebody else who knows the plants. Um, you really, it's really important to have obviously positive plant identification. So when you're learning your plants, use all your senses. Taste, touch, smell, vision, like when you, what, what color is it on the top of the leaf? What color is it underneath? What do the veins look like? You know, so if you think that you have um, wild mint and it doesn't taste at all like mint, it's not gonna be mint, okay? So use all your senses in learning them. Um, pick a few common plants and you can send me a picture. Yes. I'm happy if you wanna send me a text picture or an email picture of what you think you have. I get that from students more and more these days. Mm -hmm. So you can send it to, um, um, I guess you could type it in the chat. Yeah. Or whoever is, who is asking me, Haley? Oh yeah, this is Haley Jane. Would you like me to? Yeah, why don't you type it in the chat, Haley? So be 707-599-7476. If that's my cell, you could text me a picture or you can send me an email at janeb at arcadanet.com. janeb at arcadanet.com. We've got your phone number there too to all attendees. How sweet that you're willing to take texts and uh, emails from folks about plants out there. Yeah, well, I have a vested interest that you're not eating poisonous plants. So. <laughs> of course, yeah. yeah um, too. I've learned through the years that I don't get barraged with too many. So, also <laughs> uh, look at the web page. Look at the pictures on there because they're pretty good um, photos. And also, Cal Flora has a great web page. C A L F L O R A. Cal Flora is really detailed and you can put in there what you think it is and I'll show you different pictures. And, and also um, iNaturalist mm -hmm. is one of my favorite apps. And, and, and that too, now uh, with these apps, you know, it's gonna give you choices. Mm -hmm. So, but it'll help you narrow it to what you think it is. Another app I really like is PlantNet. And those would be other ways too. And there's a really wonderful woman back east who puts YouTubes out probably weekly. Yeah. Dina Falcone. Falcone, I believe. Yeah. Dina Falcone. D I N A F A L C O N I. And she does a really good job with those um, videos that she's sending out. And she really shows you all the parts and and she has a course online that you know you can take if you want to get more extensively into it. But you know these are free. Get on her mailing list, and yeah. I mean I watch them learn something every time. So they're really good. Yeah, um, her book Foraging and Feasting is really yes. good as well. Um, yeah. So if you didn't quite catch her name, just look up Foraging and Feasting, and you'll find her. She's wonderful. Okay, so we brought this to a boil, and I'm going to turn it down to simmer. And I'm going to keep the lid on. Okay. Any other questions there? Let's see. Looks like it. We're good? Okay. Well done. So what was I doing? I was expounding the wonderful attributes of the Dante Leon. Mm. The reason my herbal center is called Dandelion Herb, Herbal Center, the webpage is Dandelion Herb. And the reason that I named my center after the illustrious Dandelion is because 
You will often see ads about how to kill this noxious weed. And so I wanted to give this not noxious at all weed a whole other slant, which is this is powerful medicine. And so let's dig it up out of our yards rather than poisoning it. Yes. And herbal lawns are getting very popular. So that's exciting too. Okay, so I what think we, we just have the slide of dandelion okay. a little closer. Oh yeah, those are great pictures. Yeah. Really good pictures. Mm -hmm. So when you break the dandelion off, which almost all of us do when we're harvesting it, mm -hmm. that dandelion is so tenacious, yeah. it will grow from many inches under the ground. <laughs> It'll sprout and get its way back up <laughs> above the ground. <laughs> So on that note, you want to think about whether the plant that you are foraging or looking to forage is a native plant or an introduced plant. So native plants are plants that are native to their environment and they're much more vulnerable. The introduced plants, just like the introduced human species, tend to take over. And so when you're harvesting dandelion, you don't need to be too concerned about propagating it because it's most likely going to be spreading its seeds and coming up and coming up and coming up. Whereas if you're out harvesting your basanta, let's say, um, then you really need to be very aware. Your basanta is a powerful medicine plant, but it grows slowly. It has limited range. It's a um, specific plant to native people. And so you need to see like who's, where are you harvesting it from? Is this a place that people are already harvesting from? That is their place to harvest from? BLM land is a good place to go harvest, Bureau of Land Management. So get to know whether a plant is introduced or whether it's native and learn how the plant uh, is um, propagates and encourage more propagation of the plant. Thank you. Herbal oil. Herbal oil. <laughs> All right. Let's strain our fresh tea, fresh tea before we do our herbal oil. Okay. Okay. Do you have an empty cup yet or do you need another cup? No. Down our cups. Danarka. What did I do with the string? I think. Oh, no, it's right there. Okay. Compost. So this is our lemon balm, borage, and violet fresh plant tea. So, oh, that smells so fresh. <laughs> you could show them the color of that one. That's really, let's see. Can you guys see that? It's a lot lighter. Can yeah, we can, we can see it. Oh, great. Thanks, Haley. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to our help. To our help. Fresh tea, tea always tastes very deeply nourishing. Yeah. Like you're just like, oh, like every cell wants to just take that in. The nutrients mm -hmm. seem so available to me. Whereas chemically, they say when plants are dry, that the nutrients are more available because the cell structure is already broken down. Whereas in a fresh plant, the cell structure is not. That's why you break it up. But to me, mm. yeah. It's very a grounding to me, this taste, like very centering, focusing. Mm -hmm. But also 
enlivening at the same and time. Enlivening. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to turn this off now. Probably hasn't been quite that long, but. And then add the leaves. And if we had flowers, we would be adding these now too. Turned off. Well, she gets some oil for her oil. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> get some oil. Oh, while she's gone, I'll explain these pictures here. This right here is rows of delicious culinary oils made with chilies, sage, rosemary. Um, you may have made those at home yourself. They're wonderful, delicious, usually made with an olive oil or maybe a sesame oil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And down at the bottom is a lavender. I, I don't think, it doesn't quite look like lavender essential oil to me. I think that's an infused mm -hmm. lavender oil. And she's back. <laughs> I like my kitchen. <laughs> so basically, herbal concocting is a jar, some herbs, fresh or dried, and some extracting agent or solvent. So with tea, we're using water to extract the properties of herbs. And with herbal oils, we're using oil. You can use almond, olive, stuff, any oil. I like fruit or vegetable oils, but you could use lard, yeah. you know? And so you can use any oils. And there's a number of different methods, but we're just gonna talk about the infusion method today. Mm -hmm. And so just like we infused our herbs and made our tea, we're gonna infuse our oil, but it takes a little longer. Okay. That's not, you know, 10 minutes to a couple hours to even overnight sometimes with our teas. So with our oils, we'll put them in the jar and approximately two cups of oil to what we have three ounces of herb. Mm -hmm. And we put our herbs in, cover it with the oil, and I like to put it in a sunny windowsill. And if and then because oil, I think, likes some heat to help extract the property of the herbs. So you could also put it outside. Um, and we're going to use these calendula flowers. We have some very beautiful calendula that we harvested here last season. So these are really pretty. And these calendulas come yellow, orange, or this kind of rust color. And this is a mixture of all of those because I grow all three different kinds. Mm. And herbs that you dry yourself are so much more potent, of course, because they're so much fresher. Mm. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, oh, let me show you another tool I really love. I, I use my wide mouth funnel many times a day. It fits in canning jars, narrow or wide mouth, like you have leftover soup and you want to put it in a jar, just pour it right in. You have your herbs that we don't want to spill all over, so we just put our funnel there. Is machine off? Machine. So obviously I'm not weighing them, I'm just eyeballing it. But that's um, the two cups of oil in your recipe is volume and the three ounces of herb is weight, but I'm just gonna eyeball it here, put my calendula in the jar, cover it up with, or 
organic virgin olive oil. There is a reason herbalism is called the art of the simpler. <laughs> See how simple that is? All right. Oh, we better get a label, Raquel, like yeah. we were saying. Yeah. I mean, we're going to know what it is, but. So here's our jar with calendula and olive oil. And we'll put a label on it and put it on the windowsill and minimum two weeks if it's warm when it's not very warm probably a month you want to let your oil sit you want to um it's a good idea to have a container that is about the size of the oil that you want because heat light and air deteriorate oil so if you have more oil if you have more air in your jar, there's more possibility of um, your oil deteriorating. And we have our date on there and olive oil, mm -hmm. and we're all set and ready to go. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so what else with the, it's really better to use dry plants for your oils mm -hmm. because um, it's more of a process with fresh. And certainly if you take more extensive herb classes, you'll do that. But with the fresh plants have a lot of water in them and water in your oil can cause it to go rancid. And you're making these products because you want them fresh and beautiful and wonderful and not rancid. <laughs> so, and a lot of our oils, like the lip balm that's in your pocket right now or in your purse is very possibly rancid. Um, that's one of the things I like to teach is um, how you can tell the smell of rancidity. Drive by McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> so are those chips that you get out, sometimes chips taste great to you and other times you're like, these chips don't taste so good. That's because the oil has gone rancid. Mm -hmm. And rancid oil is creates free radicals, which our body has a really hard time processing. So we want to stay with oils that are fresh and vibrant. And even oils like you buy in bulk, if there's a big container of oil and it's at the bottom, mm -hmm. when you're buying it in bulk and there's all that air, there's possibility that it's rancid even when you buy it. Mm -hmm. So see what you can do about learning the smell of fresh oils and rancid oils and take a look for that. So calendula, so, oh, so some uses in general for herbal oils are, oh yeah, she's moving. <laughs> I didn't see her moving before. No. It is a massage, <laughs> sore muscles, facial serum. Oh, so calendula is wonderful on the skin. Um, Baths, putting the oil in your bath, putting it all over your skin after a shower for medicinally sprained strains, bruises. Um, you can use your herbal oil as a base for making lotions and creams and salves. Mm -hmm. And I think we have some recipes here next. Come on, there's your name. So we have our just two simple recipes. One is skin nourishing oil with calendula, comfrey leaf, and self-heal leaf and flower. And I believe we already have pictures individually. We'll show you in a bit. Yes. And then we have our calming and relaxing one with lavender, rose So you can make individual oils like we made. And you can then have it on your shelf and then combine them. Or in one jar, you can put calendula comfrey and self heal mm -hmm. and make your formula right from the start. Mm, beautiful. So there's a picture of yellow calendula flowers and then a picture of the rust colored calendula flowers. And I got those rust colored seeds from the Neil and Glenn store, which is a fabulous little local market. If you haven't been there right near three corners of Freshwater, a great little market and um, they have wonderful 
things there. And it's a good time to support them. Yeah, and yeah. a good time to support them. Yeah. yeah, they had a robbery there, so yeah. So calendula is like number one, that's fine. Calendula is <laughs> number one skin herb. And you can enhance the quality of your skin by taking calendula internally. Mm -hmm. So drinking calendula tea is an immune support, a blood purifier, and cleanses the skin from the inside out. Come back. <laughs> Comfrey. Oh, summertime picture. <laughs> Look at that Latin name, Symphidum officinale. Official for all symptoms. It's all we need. <laughs> okay, some of you probably have heard that there is controversy with using comfrey. I'm not going to go deeply into it, but basically, um, comfrey has pyrolysine alkaloids, so does cold food, so does borage, so do other plants. Taken in excess, there's a possibility it could be harmful to your liver. So the key there is excess. So just because it's an amazing healing plant. One of the highest in calcium and magnesium. The first thing I go to for healing broken bones, for healing skin, it's just an amazing plant. And topically, there's no issue at all about using comfrey. There's just a little concern about internally, but I definitely still use it and recommend it, just not in large quantities. Of course, then what is a large quantity? Is, Using it three times a day for six months. Okay. This is a beautiful little garden plant that's everywhere. Not yet. Well, the leaves are all up now, but it's not flowering yet. And it's edible, the whole plant. The same with comfrey, edible. Same with calendula. I don't know that calendula leaves are edible, but flower is edible. Comfrey, whole plant is edible. Selfio, whole plant is edible. So think about that name, Selfio. Yeah. Another name for it is Heal All. Mm -hmm. That's right. So it's very, um, it's very good anti-inflammatory, um, and it um, helps to soothe redness, inflammation, irritation. It um, is soothing, encouraging healthy cell growth and cell regeneration. Beautiful plant. Mm -hmm. Lavender. So all types of lavender are usable and you have some different types here in your photo. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I write Lavendula SPP, that means any species you can use. They do have some different activities to them. But um, basically lavender is helps to reduce um, swelling, inflammation, stop itching and lift the spirits. Rose was also in one of those herbal oil formulas, and we've talked about rose. Chamomile, there's two main types. One is perennial, which is the low growing one with just the yellow buttons, Anthemus nobilis. That is my favorite infused oil. Mm -hmm. So if you grow that plant, I pick those fresh, and this is one I will use fresh. Put them in a jar, put the jar in the middle of the chamomile patch, just keep adding flowers to it, adding oil. And with a light oil like that, I wouldn't use olive because I, I want the smell of the chamomile to come through more strongly. So I would use almond or apricot kernel. And then you have the Matricaria recutita, mm -hmm. and that's the German chamomile. And that's the one that's an annual. It reseeds every year. That's the one the flowers are in the herb shops with a beautiful, relaxing, and amazing topical anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Herbal baths. Throw a bunch of plants in your bath water and hop in. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. I think that's what we have. There you go, baby floating in petals. <laughs> <laughs> so light your candles, play music. No, put you can make tea and put it in your bath. You can put the herbs directly. You can put herbs in a big 
um, bandana and tie it up like a big tea bag, add some oats in there and put that all over your skin. Um, essential oils we haven't talked about, but um, essential oils are highly concentrated substances. So you need to be really careful with using essential oils. They come in little bottles like this. And so you just add two to 10 drops per tub of water. And essential oils are not gonna diffuse very well in your bath water. So what I generally do is like take some calendula oil and then put some essential oils in and then that will help it disperse better. I think that's it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go back to full. Okay. I've had a lot of fun teaching you all this today. I've covered a lot of material in a short amount of time. So I've just kind of, you know, skimmed over a lot of things. But I think that you've got a good foundation of how you can start creating some teas and make some oils and learn some wild edibles and Instead of putting those weeds in your compost, just go put them in your salad bowl. <laughs> so I'm going to ch chat here and see if we have some questions. And okay. I think if you're uh, okay with it, we've got a little time mm -hmm. for some questions. Haley, if that's okay with you. Oh, it's yeah. absolutely fine. Shoshana's back, but yes, <laughs> that would be great. Um, we have we don't have the next thing until technically five o'clock. So if you wanted to answer any questions, whatever you'd like to do is perfect. Oh yeah, I'm fine mm -hmm. with questions. Mm -hmm. if anybody else? So there is. Um, you're all very welcome. What do you <laughs> use calendula for? When using calendula flowers, do you just use the petals? I think you kind of touched on that. Yeah, do you just use the petals with calendula flowers? And calendula is basically great nourish, nourishing and healing for the skin all around for many different things. Yes. Um, next question from Patty. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Marika, for the last one. Um, would you use herbal infused oils for cooking? Yes, definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, let's see here. Oh, just some nice compliments. Thank you all so much. And there is a question from Jackie asking um, if you're doing the Herbal Symposium this year. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be at the Herbal Symposium this year. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they'll have it this year. Yeah. It won't have to be virtual. Mm -hmm. But the Herbal Symposium in Laytonville is a wonderful event. Great event to bring up, Jackie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am going to be doing a new series, which is going to be three herb walks. And I'm going to do one in the spring, one in the summer, and one in the fall. And it's going to be, uh, you sign up for the whole series. And we're going to go to three different magical places. And Raquel and I just thought that would be a fun offering. So you can look for that. And also, if you want to be on our mailing list, then just send us an e email and we'll put you on the mailing list. Yeah, and I think on our website, there's also a link that you can just sign up through. We have constant contact, so they make right. it really easy um, to just sign up for that as well. And you can follow us also on our social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram. I think we're just Dandelion Herbal Center on both. And you're always welcome to send us questions. Yeah, um, yeah questions about classes, herbs, anything. Thank you guys so much. I think maybe that's it. Any other questions? All right. Thanks. I'm just going to drop a link to your Facebook here. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much for all of the knowledge you have given to everybody today. It is so amazing to have this be a facet of the festival. And thank you so much for, for being here. And uh, yeah, so hopefully everyone peruses your website and gets all the information about everything upcoming and signs up for the email list and learns about all the things you have happening. <laughs> Thank you, Shana. All right. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you have clapping coming from the playhouse in different corners. You just maybe can't hear it, but it's great. <laughs> Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>